Hello, my name is Tracy McGregor. I'm an instructor with EMS University. I've been instructing CPR for about four years now, and I instruct CPR and first aid with EMS University. I'm a nationally registered EMT, um, and I've held my certification since 2006, and I've been involved with the fire service for roughly 14 years now. Today we're going to discuss the altered level of consciousness, and this comes from Lesson 4-4. Let's get started. The mnemonic for causes of altered level of consciousness are as follows. You have first the AEIOU. A, you have alcohol, acidosis, and anoxia. With alcohol, this tends to be one of the leading causes of an altered level of consciousness. Um, however, there can be some underlying issues which we'll discuss later um, within this mnemonic. You also have acidosis and anoxia. Um, acidosis is basically when your body is hyperventilating to compensate for the um, overwhelming acid in the blood. This typically happens um, during a major trauma or medical emergency. And for anoxia, you have a almost complete lack of oxygen in the blood. So for these two, um, it's very important that you put on the pulse oximeter and try and check their SpO2 levels. If they are suffering from either of these two, providing supplemental oxygen is never a bad idea. With epilepsy, as well as any other type of seizure that the patient may be experiencing, you always have to keep in mind that they may be going into postdictal. With the postdictal state, they will have a lethargic presentation and they may also be dealing with some acidosis or anoxia so one of the things you may want to do and should do is get the pulse oximeter on them and provide supplemental oxygen as necessary for I you have insulin uh, which can be a wide range of diabetic emergencies and when I was talking about alcohol uh, hyper and hypoglycemia often mirror the effects of alcohol so it's always important to go ahead, if your protocol allows, to get a glucose sample. Typically 80 and 120 are your normal ranges and then when you go above 120 you have hyper and when you go below 80 you're going to have hypo. So it's always um, important to remain cognizant of what's going on with that and never overlook it immediately assuming that it could be an alcohol issue. For O you have overdose. With overdose, you can have organic or inorganic type of medications or drugs that they're taking. Oftentimes, some people may want to be deliberately overdosing or they may be accidentally overdosing on a certain type of drug or alcohol or a medication. Geriatrics typically will be in this category because oftentimes they may forget or they may think that they're supposed to take more than they're supposed to. So keep in mind of that, uh, as we'll discuss later. Also, keep an eye on your medication bottles, um, your medication boxes that are labeled or dated. And uh, you're going to have to do a little bit of, of detective work, but it's important that you try to render if that's an issue. For you, you have uremia, <clears throat> which is also known as kidney or renal failure. Um, one of the ways you can immediately identify whether or not this patient is in a renal failure is they're going to have a uremic frost um, on their forehead and scalp. Some of the other issues are peripheral neuropathy um, as well as sometimes they're going to go into seizures and um, nausea. So those are some things but I think that the uremic frost on the uh, scalp and forehead are one of the biggest ways you can figure out what's going on. Also obtaining a sample history. For underdosing, uh, typically this might be seen with a person who is not taking their prescribed medication and um, they're going into a withdrawal-like symptom. For T, um, in the TIPS acronym, excuse me, um, you can have trauma toxins and tumors. All three of these can cause seizures, uh, which immediately will lead to your postdictal. Okay. 
Also trauma, like blunt force trauma or motor vehicle accident, they may be um, agitated, they may have uh, be slightly combative, uh, and all the other additions with an ultra level of consciousness. Toxins can be either something ingested or an environmental type thing, so it's always good to try and find out what's going on with that person and also remain cognizant of what they've taken, how they've taken that, keep in mind the routes, um, and keep in mind your safety as well as with all of these. Tumors are a little bit harder to diagnose on an EMT level. Uh, but if you suspect or if they've said something, you need to get them to the hospital immediately. Infection for the eye, uh, such as sepsis, you're going to typically find uh, often with geriatrics or folks who have a weakened immune system. Sepsis or septicemia is an infection of the blood. Uh, typically, you're going to find confusion and, del and or delirium, uh, fever, <clears throat> and chills. So sometimes they may be presenting a flu-like symptom. However, um, obtaining a detailed assessment and sample history will kind of cue you into what's going on with that. For P, with psychiatric disorders, uh, you can have a wide range of emergencies going on. Your dispatcher should provide you the detailed information when you're being dispatched and you can begin your scene assessment at that time uh, en route to the emergency location. As with all other emergencies, you should have law enforcement accompanying you on the scene and rendering that scene safe prior to entering the facility or home. Psychiat psychiatric emergencies can range from talks of suicide, successful suicide, attempted suicide, violence, domestic disturbances, or maybe just somebody needing somebody to talk to. Always try to provide empathy for that patient and never judge. Um, always remain cognizant of your surroundings as well. If the patient for whatever reason refuses to provide you the pertinent information, such as what's going on, why they're in that particular state, um, you can look over their medications. If you're privy to pharmacology, this can help you out and cue you into what's going on with that patient and the type of medication they're on. We're going to go ahead and jump over to S uh, with strokes. And you have many different types of uh, reason that person can be having a stroke and also their different types of strokes. You can have ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, or transient ischemic attack. So one of the things you want to do is you want to try and get a sample history immediately to try and find out what's going on with that patient. And some of the signs and symptoms you want to keep in mind are facial droop, sudden weakness, uh, loss of movement in extremities, muscle coordination, also known as ataxia, slurred speech. Um, so some of the things you want to do is you want to gather that information and you want to get them on an immediate transport because it is said that if a patient can be administered um, clot busters within three hours, they have a better chance of survival and, um, and rehabilitation if they were able to get that treatment as soon as possible. Now for the golden rule, altered level of consciousness is a characteristic of nervous system dysfunction and warrants thorough examination to rule out all possible causes. As I've mentioned before, also keep cognizant of your surroundings with people who are dealing with an altered level of consciousness. They may become violent and combative and you have to take precautions as a medical responder because you cannot provide medical care if you become a patient within yourself. So now let's discuss initial assessment of altered patients. First you want to assess the environment. Sometimes you may need to manipulate the environment We'll discuss that in a few minutes here. Safety of the rescuer and the environment. Our number one order in the role of providing patient care is providing safety for ourselves. If you suspect an issue um, where your safety may be compromised, stand by or stage until law enforcement has rendered the scene safe. Environmental factors. 
That can be weather, uh, that can be the surroundings, that can be if there's hostile uh, bystanders around. So you might want to keep that uh, in the back of your mind. Patient location, home, street, or convalescent. If they're at home, uh, they're typically going to have, you know, it's going to be kind of more of a, a panic within family members or bystanders. If it's a street, uh, there can be a myriad of things going on. Convalescent home uh, can be very difficult for that patient as well, as well as additional patients and staff. For weapons, um, obviously it's going to be a fairly good indicator of trauma as an MOI. However, you want to make sure that that weapon is secured by law enforcement before you even get near that patient or scene. Medications, as I've discussed in, uh, in our previous section, if you're privy uh, to that information and you are understanding in pharmacology, uh, you can help your paramedic that way in trying to figure out what's going on with that patient. But always uh, take that medication with you to the hospital and allow the physicians to uh, gather more information on what's going on with that patient. Oftentimes with certain households, you may get a shoebox full of medication, take it with you, it never hurts. Witnesses, family members, friends, bystanders, uh, just, you know, anybody who has seen or witnessed that emergency can provide you some valuable information on what's going on with that person. Empty pills, this may be an indication of an overdose. So take that empty pill bottle with you, try to find out um, how many pills are supposed to be there? Maybe a bystander saw how many pills that person took, or sometimes that person may even use candor and tell you what's going on. Mechanism of injury, uh, this is a very self-explanatory bullet as well as number of patients. Always keep in mind your airway, breathing, and circulation and assess neurological status. So basically assess the level of consciousness. You can use the Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, or neuro deficits. Uh, keep in mind restlessness, agitation, and lethargy may be due to hypoxia and degrees decreased cerebral perfusion. Unconscious and coma may be due to prolonged hypoxia, shock, head injury, metabolic disorders, neurological disorders, or other causes. So in those types of situations <clears throat> Um, if a person has fallen down, you want to do C-spine precaution, backboard that patient, and most importantly, remain cognizant of the ABCs, and if you have to, uh, do rescue breathing and or CPR. Here is the complete Glasgow Coma Scale, okay, and um, you have your, your diagram there, and basically you want to just go ahead and put the numbers together. So when you're using the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, a score of 13 through 15 may indicate a mild dysfunction. A score of 9 to 12 may indicate moderate dysfunction, and 8 or less will indicate um, a severe dysfunction. Also, I'd like to um, address the APU scale. Um, a for awake and or alert, V for verbal, P for, for pain, and you for unresponsiveness. This can also help, although it's not necessarily as in-depth as the Glasgow Coma Scale, however for quick responses the app who definitely works out very well to, uh, to your advantage. Be thorough with your, um, your OPQRST and your sample history and if we need to go through it I'll just uh, s s talk about the acronym real quick. Onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, and time, signs and symptoms, um, allergies, medications, past pertinent history, last oral intake, and the events leading up. <clears throat> These two acronyms right here can really help out at, a, um, at an emergency where you're trying to figure out what's going on with the patient. And unfortunately, sometimes we as responders have to do a little bit of detective work. So never hesitate to use your acronyms. And I know that... Um, in the EMS field, we beat, beat everybody to death, so to speak, with acronyms. But unfortunately, um, it's just kind of something we deal with. However, those acronyms can really make things easy to remember when you're, uh, when you're 
dealing with a lot of stuff going on. So some of the information you can uh, obtain from this are recent illnesses, any witnesses to the current events, when they were last known to be normal, any drug or alcohol abuse, any history of head trauma within the last few months, and did they complain of a headache or other symptoms before they became altered. Syncopal episodes um, are a medical terminology for fainting. And with syncopal episodes, it's also important to keep in mind that when a patient goes into a syncopal episode, the duration isn't very long. Um, when they kind of snap out of it, they typically do it very quickly. So um, some people may get syncopal episodes confused with other issues. However, it's really important to understand how a syncopal episode uh, differs from any other type of emergency which may be confused. Okay, now we're going to talk about head-to-toe examinations. When you're doing a head-to-toe examination, uh, this may be anything from a rapid to a secondary where you're doing a more detailed examination. You're going to be looking for trauma. You're going to be feeling, uh, palpating for deformities, uh, such as crepitus, uh, anything that is unusual also while conducting a visual inspection for such stuff as cerebral spinal fluid, um, blood, drool, anything that may indicate trauma. You're also going to be looking for medical alert tags. You're going to find these in the form of a bracelet or a necklace and some ladies may even like to use them um, as anklets. Um, that way they can kind of keep them a little bit more concealed. So never uh, overlook that. Track marks are another important thing you want to keep an eye out for. Sometimes this can be a um, indication of habitual drug use as well as um, prolonged intravenous use for medication. However, it's also important to never jump to conclusion on either of these until you've had validation. With pupil size, and response to light, that's also something you want to make sure that you're up to date with and current on your skills in performing this uh, evaluation. Pupil sizes can tell the difference between a lot of things, such as whether or not they have uh, curl pupils, which are pupils equal and round and regular in size and react to light, or if they're dilated, which sometimes may indicate some drug use. And also you may have unequal pupils, which may indicate some head trauma. So as I said before, it's always important to keep up to date on your skill set on that. Movement of extremities equal from side to side. Sometimes you're going to be looking for that with uh, stroke patients. And uh, you kind of make them put their arms out and see if they can keep them equal uh, for a prolonged period of time. Also. That goes hand in hand with your local neurological symptoms such as facial droop, slurred speech, and numbness. The most important thing when you find all of these um, are airway breathing circulation, supportive care, and rapid transport. This concludes uh, lesson 4-4, Altered Level of Consciousness. Thank you for your time.